Good morning. Happy second Sunday of the Lenten season to you all. Good to be with you in the Lord's house. Let's say good morning to our Christian friends gathering with us via the radio, via the internet. We say good morning, media friends. Here we go. Good morning, media friends. Good to have everybody gathering around the gospel uh, this morning. Second Sunday of Lent. Um, we see an awful lot, I, I would use the word determination, the determination that um, our Savior had in order to win the forgiveness of our sins, that, that nothing was distracting Jesus. He was, was dead set on accomplishing his Heavenly Father's plan of salvation, and this Lenten season focuses us, prepares us for, for that, uh, those events that our Savior accomplished for us. So everything for our service this morning is either in your service folder or up on the screen. And let's get started this morning. We begin in the name of the triune God. Let us worship the Lord our God. We worship God the Father who made us and provides for us. We worship God the Son who redeemed us with his holy precious blood. We worship God the Holy Spirit who creates and strengthens our faith. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Praise the Lord. Let's do that by singing our first hymn this morning, hymn 108. kindly stand and let's join together confessing our sins before our gracious and holy God. If I convince myself that I am good and deserving of heaven because of my kindness and decency, I am deceiving myself and I really don't know what God's word says about sin and its consequences. When I confess and am sorry for all my sins, God is merciful and just and will forgive all my sins. With this in mind, let's join together and admit our many sins before God and ask him to forgive us. 
Almighty God, you love me, but there are many times when I haven't shown my love to you. You call me through your word, but I don't always listen. So often I'm not as concerned for the welfare of my neighbors as I am for myself. I have willingly gone along with evil temptations and made myself more important than you or my neighbor. God, my Father, help me be honest with myself and with you so that I repent of my sins and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. Let us privately and silently confess those sins of which we're aware, as well as the many we do not know. Jesus says to his people, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Jesus' death paid for the guilt of all our sins as well as the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. Now because of the promise of our Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. And now go in peace, knowing that your sins are forgiven. And now through faith, strive to eliminate those sins which you, which we, have just confessed. O Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you answered me. I thank you for the love you have shown me in Jesus Christ my Savior. Through him you have rescued me from the guilt and punishment of my sins and also given me the peace of forgiveness. Help me fight against temptation, correct my sinful life, and move me to serve you and those around me with love and good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. join together praying our prayer of the day this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that if left on our own, we have no power to defend ourselves against sin and Satan. Please guard and keep us safe from all temptations and dangers that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may attack and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. 
Our first scripture lesson this morning, the second Sunday of the season of Lent, comes from the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah. We've been reading from Jeremiah quite a bit uh, in the last few months. And it fits in with this whole theme of second Sunday of, of Lent, um, to say determination, humanly speaking, boy, Jeremiah's ministry would not have been very fun. He was not very well received at all by the Jews against whom he was preaching. Here God is saying, Jeremiah, go preach repentance to the Israelites, to the Jews. They didn't like it. Didn't like it so much that they wanted to kill Jeremiah. But don't we see the determination, the faithfulness of Jeremiah, the example for us, the ultimate example, Jesus Christ, uh, the determination that we have to be faithful. Faithful in our lives, faithful in our sharing of that gospel message. Jeremiah 26. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen, and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city a curse among all the nations of the earth. The priests, the prophets, and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, You must die! Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh and this city will be desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to speak all these words in your hearing. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, This man should not be sentenced to death. He has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. That's the end of our Old Testament lesson. Let's sing verses 1 and 2 of our next hymn, hymn 397.
This morning we're going to be confessing our Christian faith in two parts. Part one here talking about the importance, the foundation, the, the use of God's holy word, the Bible. What part uh, does that Bible, the truths of God's word, play in our salvation? Then part two, a little bit we'll be getting to the role of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit working together for our salvation. So let's focus on God's word, the Bible, confessing our faith about that Bible. We join together. We believe that God has given a written revelation of himself through the Holy Scriptures, which is meant for all people. This revelation, called the Bible, has two main messages called the Law and the Gospel. The Law declares what is right and wrong in God's eyes and also promises punishment when we sin by disobeying those laws. The Gospel presents the love of God which is especially shown through the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation won by Jesus Christ. We believe that the entire Bible is centered on this Savior from sin, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God repeatedly promised that a deliverer from sin, death, and hell would come in the future. The New Testament proclaims that this promised deliverer has come in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. We believe that scripture is a unified whole, true and without error in everything it says. For Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 35, the scripture cannot be broken. Therefore, it is the infallible authority and guide for all we believe and do. We believe that the Bible is fully sufficient clearly teaching us all we need to know in order to get to heaven. It makes us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, and it equips us to live God-pleasing lives. Since God's plan of salvation has been completely revealed in the Bible, we need and expect no other revelations or additions. a good thing to have positive role models. I think of us in our Christian faith. I think of myself and my Christian faith and life to think back to people who have been examples, positive, beneficial examples for me to follow. Teachers, friends, parents, family, what have you. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about. Um, to remember those examples, remember those positive role models that we have. And of course, <laughs> The ultimate role model, right? The best example for us to follow Jesus Christ himself. Uh, but to take advantage of those opportunities that we have of fellow Christians, fellow friends, role models, examples for us to follow. Philippians chapter 3. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. 
but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. It's the end of our epistle lesson. confess our faith about that trinity the triune god three persons yet one god father son holy spirit and the specific individual things those three persons do all working together to save us let's join together i believe that there is only one true god who is also three persons father son and holy spirit any other so-called god is a man-made idol I believe that this triune God is completely responsible for my existence and salvation. My Heavenly Father created me in my mother's womb and has blessed me richly in body and soul. He provides all that I need in this life and still protects me by sending his angels to watch over me. My Savior Jesus, the Son of God, took on human flesh lived perfectly under the law, and died shamefully on a cross, all that I might no longer belong to Satan but to God, and all that I might serve my Lord wholeheartedly for all my days. The Holy Spirit brought me to faith and continues to strengthen my faith through the gospel in word and sacrament. He teaches me that my good works are to thank God for his blessings, not to earn them. He assures me of forgiveness, the resurrection of my body, and the bliss of heaven. I believe that my life and my salvation are precious gifts from God, for which I can best thank him by praising and obeying him, loving my neighbor, and sharing the gospel with the people around me. I believe I can do these and all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Would you grab a hymn? Now let's sing our second hymn this morning, or our next hymn, I should say, hymn 441. <laughs>
grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, being married to the gal that I am married to has given me many opportunities to go places that I am very certain I would never have been before. Dear Jody, having been born and raised down yonder in Phoenix, Arizona, gives us, gave us the opportunity to go down there and visit family, what have you. And again, to go to some places I have never been before, to do things I have never done before. One of those things was going to a small town called Jerome, Jerome, Arizona. Jody and I, had, we had to refresh our memories the other morning about this trip. Why was it that we went to Jerome, Arizona? That if you have a map, mental map of Arizona in your noggins, you look at Arizona, there's Phoenix and there's Flagstaff up here. I-17 goes between. If you go a little bit to the west of I-17, 20, 25 miles or so, Sedona area, you'll find Jerome. Little town right now between four or 500 people, not that big of a town on, on the map of Arizona. But you look at the history, the history of Jerome. There's quite a long, long history to that little town. It got started because somebody found gold and copper. Started as a little mining town, and before you knew it, when people find out there's gold and copper in them there yonder hills, what happens? They all congregate, they go there, to try and strike it rich, getting at that gold and copper. Many did. The little town, the little mining camp of Jerome grew into some, a town some 15,000 people in it, at its heyday. But in the 40s and the 50s, that wealth, those resources of gold and copper ran out. And you can imagine what happens next. That thriving, bustling town of Jerome, Arizona, the mining town, shriveled up. <clears throat> People left. There was no reason, humanly speaking, to stay there in the middle of the desert with nothing, literally nothing. Everything was gone, turned into a ghost town. But in the 60s, 70s, some hardy people that still live there decided to keep their town going. Right now, if you go to Jerome, it's more of an artsy, craftsy kind of, kind of town. You go there to those little knick-knack shops and what have you. <clears throat> Pardon me. Go to the shops. You go to the local restaurant, the bar and grill, and get a good hamburger and a cold beer. It's kind of a destination, a day trip destination. But really, if you're going from Phoenix, you're going to Flagstaff or vice versa, <clears throat> it's really a distraction. If you're in a hurry, you do not go out of your way to stop in Jerome, Arizona. Now you may not, you did not hear, you will not hear the words ghost town in our text, but you will hear the word desolate. Jesus is rebuking. Jesus is addressing the situation, the spiritual situation that was going on with the Jews, with the Israelites. That even though Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, by no means, humanly speaking, was desolate, was a ghost town that didn't have any people living in it, Jerusalem was huge, was a large city, had all kinds of people in it. Again, humanly speaking, you would not call it a ghost town. But spiritually speaking, when Jesus saw the desolation, when he saw the abandonment that people had, of their faith, the abandonment of them following the Lord Jesus, the faithful God who was taking care of them, he called them out. He called them desolate and, in essence, called them, spiritually speaking, a ghost town. And so we have here the reminder, the encouragement for us in our Christian living as we walk again down this Lenten path to take a, take a detour around the ghost town trap. That first of all, we're reminded in our verses for this morning that Jesus most certainly followed his destiny, followed his path, the path that God had laid out for him for this plan of salvation. He was following it to a T, following it faithfully. And when we talk about destinations and carrying out the plan of salvation, Jesus' goal in this whole process is for us, for you and me, to reach that final destination ourselves, the destination of heaven. 
So we read this morning our gospel lesson, which is from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 13. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's our text. Something seemed pretty funny to you, strange to you, reading through that text. Whenever I hear the word Pharisee and you see it connected with Jesus, I certainly do not see and remember that connection, that relationship between Pharisees and Jesus as a positive relationship. We've gone down that path, that Lenten path, many times, and we're very familiar how those Pharisees were the religious enemies of God. They wanted to get rid of Jesus, and here, it certainly sounds like, at least superficially, that these Pharisees are giving a warning to Jesus. Jesus, look out. We care for your welfare. Take, take, take extra precautions because Herod is out to kill you. Now, quite honestly, we, we are not given a reason, specific reason, why the Pharisees <clears throat> were saying what they said to Jesus. It's pretty certain they were not looking out for his welfare. But some, some of the speculation would be to say, here at this point in Jesus' ministry, he was on his way to Jerusalem. He was on his way from the north to the south to Jerusalem. And the Pharisees, this is speculation, wanted to take care of Jesus down there in Jerusalem. They were better prepared to take care of him there. So Jesus, don't stick around here in Perea too long. Go down. Go down to Jerusalem. Or some would speculate there was something going on with this Herod guy. Remember, this was the same Herod that executed John the Baptist some three years earlier to this. You think of Jesus responding to this warning that the Pharisees gave to him, and you see a very honest response that this Herod was not the nicest guy in the world. He wasn't afraid to take advantage of his power and authority just like he did with John the Baptist. John the Baptist preached repentance. Herod, you're living in adultery. Repent. Herod didn't like it, threw him into prison. Long, long story short, eventually Herod beheaded John the Baptist. Herod was not the nicest guy. He was a conniving politician doing whatever it took to keep his power and authority. But we can learn a lesson about this whole determination. Jesus had blinders on, you could say. It's not a stretch to say Jesus had a one-track mind, not only throughout his life, not only through this, this three-year ministry that he was performing, but especially these last few weeks of his life. He knew exactly what was coming up. He knew exactly his destination, the very specific destination. He needed to go to Jerusalem. He knew exactly the horrific events that would be taking place at Jerusalem, and yet he says to the Pharisees, referring to, to Herod and his destination that, that Jesus had, Jesus says, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Right? Couldn't you say Jesus had a two-focused attack, a two-focused ministry? And his primary focus is what he mentions there last, right? I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. On the third day I will reach my goal, the third day, rising from the dead, the third day after his execution, the punishment that Jesus endured for us, 
First and foremost, Jesus knew this plan of salvation established by his heavenly Father years and thousands of years before in the garden even needed to happen this way. The determination, the commitment that our Savior Jesus had to stay on that path of salvation for us. But he also says, right, there's another kind of ministry, that physical ministry, the physical service, the the Christian love and service that you and I as Christians give to one another. I must still cast out demons. I must still do some healing. There's ministry service for me to be doing. Certainly, Jesus was not distracted at all from this goal, the plan of salvation that his heavenly Father made for him, carrying out as faithfully as the Son of God and also as the Son of Man, true man and true God. And this is where we get to the example, the illustration that we have of, of a ghost town. I said this before about Jerome, right? Jerome, Arizona. At one point, late 19th century, 15,000 some people there. But why is it called a ghost town today? Because it's just not now what it used to be. All the people left, they abandoned Jerome. When the wealth and the treasure of that gold and that copper was gone, so were the people. And this is when Jesus talks, refers to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to the Jews at that time. A warning, an encouragement for us today, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the warning of abandoning our Savior Jesus Christ. There is that comparison, Jerome, Arizona, while the wealth was there, the people were there, but when it was gone, they left. But you look at Jerusalem, and that comparison fall short a little bit to say Jerusalem, the church, myself, faith. Has the good Lord ever abandoned us with his grace? Has the wealth of his grace and love and mercy ever left us? Has he ever taken that away? When it's not there, when that grace and that mercy is not there, it's because I've chosen for it not to be there. I've chosen to neglect and and not follow God's holy word. But yet, don't we also, time after time, see this patience of our Savior God? You think back to our Old Testament lesson. The patience, the love, the mercy that our God had with the Old Testament Jews. The patience and the love and the mercy that he has for you and I today. And this is when he brings in up this illustration of an animal, a bird, a hen. How those animals, a hen in particular, and even, right, mothers and fathers, human beings, have the same natural instinct to protect their young, to protect our children. We think of human examples of how many times you hear about mom and dad sacrificing a life, sacrificing their own safety in order to protect their children from danger. The picture of a hen spreading out her wings over those chicks, over her children, to protect them from whatever danger is, is immediately there. A fire, a predator trying to eat them up, what have you. But Jesus says, this is the protection, this is the love, this is the commitment I am showing to sinners. <clears throat> and yet, time after time, I think of how often I... Refuse to take advantage of that protection. I know better. I want differently. I'll abandon my Savior God, even though all that wealth, all that treasure of God's grace, all that treasure of God's blessing is there for me to use and take advantage of. Yet how often don't I say, eh, not right now, God. I've got better things to do. I've got other things to follow things that detract me from that path, that destination of eternal life in heaven. Every time I sin, there's that distraction away from the path that God, our Savior, has laid out for us. And yet time after time, right? Starting all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, that first gospel promise, when God talks to Satan and talks about a crushing that's going to happen, and yet you, Satan, are going to strike his heel the Savior God is talking about that complete victory that our Savior has won for us on the cross. Satan's head, sin's head, was completely crushed, completely defeated when Jesus says, it is finished. 
I've paid for the sins of all mankind, for you, for me. And then you think of this whole process, this whole process of salvation, that after that first gospel promise, we also are reminded of the truth, the destination that that our Savior God has for us for eternity. That when this plan of salvation was laid out, we're reminded, right? This earthly life that we're in the middle of right now, obviously it's not forever. It's very temporary. And St. Paul paints a very interesting picture, illustration for us, reminding us of the temporary status of this earthly life. Why do I give so much attention to right here and right now? And sure, God gives us responsibilities, and let's take care of them. Let's live our Christian lives as faithfully as possible. But what should get the highest priority of my attention? It's that destination, that pathway to the destination of eternal life in heaven. And so Paul paints a picture in 2 Corinthians 5 about the difference between living in a tent, a temporary tent, and reaching that eternal destination of life in heaven, the heavenly home that is waiting for us. St. Paul reminds us of this destination when he says in 2 Corinthians 5, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And so don't we rejoice? Aren't we eternally thankful for that victory our Savior Jesus won? You think about those words, that illustration, that picture that God gave in Genesis 3. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Complete victory, but Jesus had his heel struck. There was a price to pay for the forgiveness of our sins. And thankfully, our Savior Jesus was completely perfectly determined to achieve that goal for us. And so also, we thank him for that goal, that destination that he gave for us. And so I like to travel. I like to go around, going here in Nebraska from here to there. You know, okay, the interstates can be okay when you're in a hurry. I have to admit, I like to travel on the back roads. I like to go out of my way to get off of I-17 and see what Jerome, Arizona is about. I like to do that and say, little town Nebraska up in the sand hills, wherever, to go and explore and do that. But in the end, usually when we're traveling, there's a final destination. You can't spend too much time in Jerome. You can't spend too much time in Burwell or wherever you're going. But you have to keep moving. And so here, dear friends, is a reminder for us. Let's be thankful for it. Let's take advantage. Let's use the gifts, the blessings that the good Lord has given us here and now, those earthly blessings. But always, always keeping in mind not to get distracted by those ghost towns that the, Satan, this, that the devil uses to try and distract us away from that path of salvation. Let's detour around those ghost town traps as we're on our way to salvation because we see Jesus most faithfully walked on his path for our salvation. And now he wants us to reach our goal, our destination as well. Amen. Would you kindly stand? <clears throat> and now may the grace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach eternal life in heaven. Amen.
since our thank offerings are part of our lives of worship to our holy God, uh, we include that as part of our, our worship service here this morning. A little bit after we pray our offering prayer, we'll bring our thank offerings to the Lord's altar, thanking him for those blessings. But right now, let's join together in our offering prayer. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you have plans for me that are for my good and your glory. You said, give and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give back to you as a thankful response to your goodness to us. Graciously receive our offerings and continue to supply all our needs. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy guide everything we do. In your mighty name we pray. Before we get to our responsive prayer printed there on page 9, uh, we're going to have a, a special, include a special prayer for uh, the people, the folks over there in, in the Ukraine. I, I put some uh, information in the bulletin from, from Synod that there is a, a small Lutheran church body there that our, our Synod, the Wisconsin Synod, is, is connected with and supporting and uh, should give you some information concerning that, but then also just keeping the country, keeping the citizens of, of Ukraine in our prayers this morning. We pray. Lord God, in this world of darkness and evil, the light of your saving gospel continues to shine. Through that good news, you have brought people around the world from the darkness of sin and death into your marvelous light. But evil exists. And Satan's work in this fallen world continues. As many in Ukraine are experiencing unimaginable hardships and suffering, we ask that you would be with them, protect them, provide for them, and above all, strengthen their faith and trust in you and your promises. We commend them to your gracious care, knowing that you have promised to be with them always. Even though they are now walking through the shadow of death, enable them to fear no evil. We ask you, in your love and wisdom, to restore peace and safety to those now enduring the horrors of war and bloodshed, and to continue let your, to let your gospel message be the comfort and hope that so many desperately need. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. We join responsibly. Our Father in heaven, Heavenly Father, we praise you that you have adopted us as your forgiven children for Jesus' sake. We boldly come to you in Jesus' name as dear children come to a loving Father. Hallowed be your name. We pray that your...
your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today, our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. join together in Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated and let's sing our closing hymn this morning. Grab a hymnal again, would you? Hymn 327.
Good morning again. Thank you. So good. So good to be with you this morning. Everything. Um, thankful, right? This is the weekend that, that I personally am a little nervous, a lot nervous about this whole spring ahead thing, this time change thing. So thankful that I remember to turn my clocks forward, first of all, but then also other people have remembered to do that too. So uh, always good, always good to see people in, in God's house at the appropriate time there when it's set. So thanks, good to see you this morning. I don't really have a, a whole lot extra to share with you, a reminder for Wednesday nights till we meet again, Wednesday night. Uh, the 5 o'clock uh, Lenten supper thing is, is happening, and just a, a good opportunity to sit down and chat and visit with with people you may not get to do that with so very often, and then come upstairs here and gather around the Word again. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, Pastor Schultz from Stanton should be here. This is when we start the first two weeks, Ash Wednesday, and the first Sunday, um, for the last few years anyway, in this rotation, have been guys stay at their, their home place those first two weeks, but then now we start getting around to, to, to the area of congregation. So good, good. Good thing, good thing to, to hear the guys around us and to be with the, the congregations around us too. So take advantage of that if you can. Uh, blessings, blessings on your Sundays, blessings on the remainders of your weeks as we all live to serve our gracious God and also to serve the people around us. Good morning.